never done before. Um, Jerry kind of gave us some guidance on some songs that he would like to have done this season. But we're going to try them. And he ain't even here. He ain't even here. All right. But he thought we butchered them too bad. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. That is a possibility. There's another car rolling around. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, please stand if you wish and join us as we sing, What a Mighty God We Serve.
welcome. Good rainy morning, everybody. If it was anything like our house. Now see the 
for sure into that. Uh, out of Isaiah chapter 9, Pastor Jerry looked at uh, the wonderful counselor last week. Today we're looking at the mighty God, which worked out well, because I think we sang about him about three different songs today, so uh, the song matched up very well. Uh, and so, uh, and then next week we'll look, next week and the following week we'll finish out uh, when Pastor Jerry comes back. Uh, let me just read the passage first again, since we looked at it last week. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we're going to look at it from kind of the Old Testament perspective, then we'll look at what does the New Testament have to say about uh, this idea of the mighty God. Now, one of the weird things about Isaiah 9 is, Almost every messianic passage in the Old Testament is directly quoted in the New Testament. You know, Isaiah 714, Matthew says, and this will be fulfilled about Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 is never quoted in the New Testament about Jesus. So it is a little bit of a strange thing that, that never happened, but we're going to see there's a lot of connections uh, that come from this. But first we're going to look at what does this term mighty God even mean? Uh, in Hebrew, it's El Gabor. El is the common name for God in the Old Testament. You know, you have El Shaddai, El Elhim, all different kinds of godly names that begin with El. Uh, it wasn't just the way, the way that the Jews called God, it was just the general name for God. The, the Canaanites called their gods El and these kind of things. They think of it like the general term God. When we say God, we mean the Christian God, but if you're talking to a Muslim person and they say God, they mean the Islamic God or whatever, you know, these kind of things. And so it was a general term for God. Uh, and then Gabor, the t we translate it mighty or powerful. It's used with God throughout the Old Testament. You see this in Deuteronomy and Psalms, Jeremiah, Zephaniah. But maybe the more important one is in the next chapter. In Isaiah chapter 10, it says, The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And in that context, it is talking about what we would today call God the Father. And so when we look at this passage and we see, well, who is this child? It becomes clear this is not an ordinary kid. This is not a person who was going to be born in an, in an ordinary way. There's something special about this child. He has the qualities of God. He is mighty like God is mighty, and he is even called God in, in, in the passage. Uh, and so how exactly does that work uh, in terms of the life of Jesus? And we're going to see... Uh, three different ways that this comes through. So first we see the deity of Jesus. Is Jesus does Jesus line up with these qualifications? Is he El like the El Gabor of Isaiah 9-6? Well, we'll see in several different passages that talk about this. In Luke 1, 29-33, we looked at this uh, several weeks ago in Sunday school. This is the story where Gabriel comes to Mary if you remember the Christmas story and tells her, hey, you're going to have a son, and she's like, well, how is that going to happen? Uh, I don't know if, how angel biology works, but uh, as humans, it uh, doesn't happen that way. And he has to explain it to her. But she says, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, that his is Gabriel, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great or mighty, if you wanted to call it that as well. And he will be called the son of the highest. 
meaning he will be the Son of God. Uh, and we'll see this in other passages as well. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Uh, and so I think Luke is clearly connecting this back to Isaiah 6. He's going to be called the Son of God, and he's going to be in the line of King David. And we saw that in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. I'm not going to talk about the forever stuff, because Jerry's going to talk about that next week, because the everlasting father. But uh, we'll see. So right off the bat, in the New Testament, they come to Mary and they say, hey, you're going to have a son. And she's like, well, that's going to be interesting. Uh, and he's not only going to have a son, you're going to have God's son. And she's like, well, how? <laughs> first of all, I'm not, I don't even know how I'm going to have a son. How am I going to have the son of God? And the angel has to explain it, that this is going to happen through the Holy Spirit. So right off the bat, we get that Jesus is not an ordinary person. He's not a humble rabbi. He's not just some great teacher. He was the Son of God. That was made clear from the very beginning. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in Matthew 3, this is at the, the baptism of Jesus. Remember, he goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, who is his cousin, baptizes him, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove and, and, and dwells him, and they hear this voice that comes from heaven. And it says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Again, tying that Jesus is the son of God, the deity of Jesus. He's, he is God in the flesh. In Matthew 16, the, the, Jesus goes up to the disciples. He always asks them questions. And sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they don't get it right. In this case, they actually get it right. Uh, and he says, hey... Who do people say that I am? You know, I've been doing this for a little bit. I've been doing miracles. I've been doing all these things. Who do people think that I am? And they, and they go, well, you know, some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think you're a prophet. And he goes, okay, well, who do you think I am? You guys have been living with me. You've been traveling with me. Who do you think that I am after all this? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, he has a twofold answer. First, he says, you're the Messiah. Christ is just another way we say the Messiah. You're the guy we've been waiting for for literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. The, the king who's going to come. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you are the son of the living God. You're not just a normal, you're not just another king. You're not just another person. You are the son of God. You are divine. In Matthew 26, people always ask, well, did Jesus, you know, this is what everybody else is saying about Jesus. Did Jesus ever talk about being divine? And we see, we're going to see three examples of that. In Matthew 26, uh, Jesus is uh, on trial at this point. The Pharisees have got him under trial, and they're trying to get him to uh, say things that will cause him to be killed. It says, but Jesus kept silent. He doesn't defend himself initially. Uh, they bring up all these false witnesses. They do all these things. But finally, the high priest uh, asks him a question. He says, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. He's like, uh, tell us that you were what Peter said you were earlier in the story. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said. He says, yep. I am. I, I am not only the Messiah, I am the Son of God. Nevertheless, I say to you, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. It's like, not only am I the Son of God, but I'm going to go and sit on the throne of God or on the right hand of the Father's throne, and I'm going to come back on the clouds. Uh, coming back on the clouds, we see that at the rapture, and we also see that at the second coming. Uh, that Jesus will one day return uh, on the th horse, on the great white horse in the book of Revelation and, and defeat the forces of evil. And he says, now, I'm not just a normal guy. I am the son of God. I am God in the flesh. 
John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now to us, we'd say, well, what is, what is he talking about there? Uh, they asked him, well, you know, why should we listen to you? We have Abraham. Abraham is uh, the father of Israel. He's the first, the first guy all the way up in the line. And Jesus says, well, guess what? Uh, I came before Abraham. And they're thinking, all right, Abraham was born like 2,000 years ago. How old are you? <laughs> not, not from a human perspective. He couldn't have been older than me. But he's saying, I was before Abraham. I am God in the flesh. And he takes the royal name of God, the I am. Uh, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai with the burning bush, and, he, and he con he's confronted with God by God, and he says, well, how am I, who am I supposed to tell <coughs> the people, what's your name? We don't have a name for you, God. And he says, I am. So Jesus says, uh, hey, I am. I am God, just like the God of the Old Testament. Uh, the Hebrews would not even use this term. They would not even use the term I am because it was such a holy name to them. And Jesus is taking that upon himself, showing that he is God. And then finally in John 14, 9, uh, Philip, who we know is uh, one of the disciples, is talking to Jesus. And he says, hey, uh, Jesus, we want to see God the Father. Can you kind of show him to us? And Jesus is sitting there going, Dude, I've been with you a long time. Like, it, you're still not getting it. You know, I have students. We are in final exam time now. Uh, I had one final on Friday. We have another final on Monday. Uh, and there are many, most, 99% of my students figure stuff out. And at the end of the semester, there's usually one student who I'm still like, I don't think you have learned a single thing in this entire <laughs> class. Uh, and, they, and that's usually what happens. You usually have one or two of those, especially when you have, you know, large sections. And I think that's what Jesus is with the disciples sometimes. He goes, have you guys been paying attention? Like, what is wrong with you? Why can you not figure this out? But he says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not, not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So I, I think it's pretty clear in the, in the Gospels that they make it very, very clear that Jesus is not just an ordinary person. He wasn't just a little baby that was born in a manger and like everybody else. He was God in the flesh, the mighty God. He fulfills that L portion of the mighty God that Isaiah was talking about. But then does he fulfill? He's got a 50% right now. He's got the L portion, but does he fill the mighty portion? You know, 50% is still a failing grade. At least it currently is. I mean, the, they keep dropping the grades down in public schools. Pretty, enough, pretty soon there will be no failing grades. But he's only got a 50% now. So do we see the mightiness of Jesus? Well, we see this all over the Gospels. In Matthew 14, Jesus... Uh, calms the storm. This is, remember, they're out on the boat. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples. They're out on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm comes. Uh, and the, uh, the disciples are so scared that they're going to die that they wake Jesus up. And they say, Jesus, wake up. We're in the middle of a storm. Kind of like something last night or something like that. Now, this is not, you know, me out on the boat with Jesus. I am not a fisherman. I went fishing several times and I've never caught a fish. I must be doing something wrong. Somebody's going to have to show me how to do this or something. Uh, and I'm not great on boats. I kind of get seasick unless it's a big boat. Uh, but these are professional fishermen. Remember, Peter and James and John and these guys. So you know how bad this storm must have been for professional fishermen to go, uh, yeah, we're going to die, Jesus, if you don't wake up and do something here. And Jesus stands up and just goes, all right, uh, storm, stop, and it stops. And the disciples are looking around going, uh, what just happened? <laughs> like, we thought you were going to help us. We didn't realize you had the power to stop a storm. And so they said, truly you are the Son of God. His power, his might over nature. Then we see in John 11 that Jesus has the might over death. This is the story of Lazarus. Uh, Jesus is out preaching and teaching, and he gets a messenger, and they say, hey, uh, Jesus, your friend Lazarus 
is dead. Or not dead, is sick, is very sick. He's on his deathbed, basically. Uh, and Jesus in 11 John and 11 4 says, When he heard this, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He's like, He's not going to die. It's good. He, he's sick so that when I heal him, people will know that I am the Son of God. They'll see my power. And the disciples are like, oh, good. And then they get there, and Lazarus is dead. And they're like, well, how is this? Well, Jesus, uh, you said you were going to heal him, and now he's dead. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, and even Mary and Martha show up, and they're like, hey, Jesus, where have you been? We sent for you like days ago. Lazarus is dead now. What in the world is going on? We thought you could heal this guy. We thought you could heal our brother. And Jesus is like, well, you know, I'm going to heal him. And they're like, yeah, 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 we know you're going to heal him at the end of history and all this. He's like, no, no, no. He like goes over to the tomb and brings Lazarus back from the dead, showing that he has the mighty power over the grave itself, that even death cannot stop Jesus. The people around Jesus saw his might. Even the Pharisees see this. In John 3, you have the story of Nicodemus. He is a, a Pharisee. Remember, he's one of the religious leaders that is kind of going against Jesus in some ways. And it says that he comes to Jesus by night. He doesn't want to be seen with Jesus. Remember, they don't have uh, TikTok and uh, all the phone things. You come at night, people can't see you. There's no electricity. Uh, you can kind of hide away in the corner and nobody can see you. So he comes to Jesus by night and he says to him, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs or these miracles that you do unless God is with him. So even Jesus' critics at first go, we know there's something different about you. You're doing stuff that we can't figure out. I mean, think about the amount of miracles that Jesus did, you know. Uh, we've been going through the book of Luke in Sunday school, and I think we're about 10 chapters in, and we've probably seen 50 miracles in the book. Jesus would go into a town and heal every sick person in the town. We don't know how many sick people there are, uh, probably a lot. And he would do this uh, all the time. He, people would just touch him and be healed. He performed miracle after miracle after miracle. He raised people from the dead. He calmed the storm. He did all these things. And so the Pharisees never try to say, he didn't do the miracles because they couldn't deny him because there's too many witnesses. Everybody had seen this. I mean, he's making lame people walk. He's healing people who have been blind their whole life. He's doing all these kinds of things. And so they're like, we know you're from God because there's no way any person could do this. You, your, your power is too great. Now, unfortunately, if you continue reading the book of John, uh, eventually, in order to get around this, the Pharisees go, well, uh, we don't really like you, and if we say you're from God, people are going to do this. So maybe you're from Satan. Maybe you're doing these things from Satan. Uh, and Jesus even calls them out on them. He says, um, guys, I'm casting out demons. Why would Satan, if I'm working for Satan, why am I casting out demons? It doesn't make any sense. And they stop you know, doing stuff. Uh, but we see that even his enemies acknowledge his might. And even at his death on the cross in Matthew 27, Remember what happens at the cross? It's not an ordinary crucifixion. It gets dark for in the middle of the day. There's an earthquake that happens. There's all this kind of weird, miraculous stuff that happened at the crucifixion to the point that even one of the Roman centurions, I mean, the Romans were not Jewish. They're Roman. They're pagan, as pagan as you could get. Even a Roman centurion who had been there sees the earthquake, sees all the things, and says, truly this was the Son of God. Like, this wasn't an ordinary person that we just crucified. This guy was the Son of God. And so we see the might of Jesus. He passes the test. He, he's the El and the Gabor of Isaiah 9-6. But what is interesting in the Gospels and, and we'll spend a little bit of time here today on this, is that while Jesus is the mighty God, he's not only the mighty God, he also has what I call the mighty reversal of God. 
Meaning that Jesus is all powerful, but because of his mission, he, he stops his power. He doesn't always use his... He would never have went to the cross if he did not do that. For example, people were looking for a mighty king, but Jesus came as, as the divine child. In Luke, it says that while they were there, the days were completed for Mary to be delivered... And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Jesus, if I was God, I think I would have came down with lightning and thunder and power and been like, hey guys, I'm here. But Jesus didn't do that. He comes down as a little baby. Uh, we never had a baby, obviously. But we have nieces and nephews. We've all held them a lot. Uh, I'm the youngest, and Allie's the youngest, so we have. I never had a little sister. My little sister is now a dog because my mom and dad got a dog, and they keep telling them that it's my that I'm her brother, and I'm like, this is just a little strange, but uh, whatever. I only got a sister, and uh, it's a dog, but uh, however it works. I do have sisters-in-law, so that that's better than the dog version. But uh, but uh, we you know carry a little baby around, and you understand, babies are as as frail as humanly possible. They don't feed themselves. They don't even really clean up after their bathrooms. So you got to do everything for a baby. So God, and for God to come down and be in the form of a baby is as humbling as you could possibly get. And he does that in order to establish his ministry. And that's the Christmas story. But it doesn't just stop there. People were also looking for a mighty warrior. But Jesus came as the suffering Messiah. In Matthew 26, this is when Jesus gets arrested. If you remember that story, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, and his disciples keep falling asleep. He's like, hey, pray with me. And then like three seconds later, they're all passed out asleep. And he keeps waking them up and waking them up. Waking them. Finally, the Judas comes with the, the guards to arrest Jesus. And Peter, who is uh, always a little... Uh, Let's just say he does things without thinking, maybe, sometimes. Uh, he just whips out his sword and cuts off Malchus's ear. And it's like, uh, yeah, we're, you're not taking Jesus. I'll fight all of you. Now, there's a whole lot of guards, and there's one of Peter. I'm not sure how he thought he was, uh, unless he was like Jack Bauer or something. I'm not sure how he was going to fight all the guards off, but uh, he, he thought he was going to do it, apparently. But Jesus says this. He tells Peter, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? He's like, Peter, if I wanted to stop this, I could. All I got to do is speak, and 12,000 angels are going to come down. Now, how much damage can 12,000 angels do? There's two angels that destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole region. Imagine what 12,000 angels could do. They could wipe out the entire planet, basically. So he's like, if I just spoke, 12,000 angels would come down here and just wipe this out. But why does he, Jesus not do that? Because he says, how could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Meaning, if I did that, how would I die on the cross for the sins of the world? How would I fulfill and become the suffering Messiah that I was supposed to be if I used all my power to do this? If I stopped this? He could have stopped it at any moment, and yet he didn't. In fact, even on the cross, we see the ultimate reversal of God. Jesus had the power to walk off that cross at any moment. I mean, he's God. He could have stopped at any moment, but he chose to stay there for us. And in fact, he is actually challenged to do this very thing by the, by the people there in Matthew 27. It says, And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. They're like, hey, you've been telling everybody you're the Son of God? Prove it. Come down off the cross. And Jesus could have been like, oh, yeah, okay, you want me to do that? Fine. But then we would have been left to our sins. 
Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him. Now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Now imagine how hard that would have been for Jesus. First of all, he's on a cross. That's already hard enough. He's already been beaten and everything else. If you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, you know how bad that was. And that's not even as bad as it could be. Otherwise, they would have had to kill the actor guy. He went to the hospital three times when they were filming. Uh, but he's already there. He's about to suffer the wrath of God. And now people are saying, hey, if you're really God, come off the cross. And Jesus says, I'm not going to. I'm going to show my might in a different way. Not because, not by showing you how powerful that I can be, but showing you how much I love you by dying on that very cross. And so we see from Isaiah 9, 6, the, the, the mighty God, the El Gabor, that Jesus was God. That's pretty clear in the gospel. You can't get around that. He was God in the flesh. That little baby that came down, you know, we see nativity scenes all over the place. Uh, you probably have one in your house. You probably have one in your yard or your neighbor has one in his yard or you drive by them every five seconds uh, on the street. Uh, we see that little baby uh, at Liberty. We used to have, they, they've changed the nativity scene out when we were in undergrad. Uh, now he's already laughing because he knows the story. Uh, they had a, a real nice nativity scene, but the Jesus was by himself. It was like a separate piece. Uh, and uh, our students uh, would keep constantly stealing Jesus. Uh, in fact, in Convo, one of the old pastors would say, uh, please, please bring back baby Jesus. No questions asked. Uh, we just need the, our God back in the nativity scene uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, we see that all the time, but we, we see him as a little baby, and sometimes we forget that he was, even as a baby, he was the mighty God. He was the El Gabor. He was the one, the all-powerful God. But because of that, he also laid aside his power in order to save us, to die on the cross, to live his ministry, to do all the things that he had to do because he loved us, because he wanted us to spend in heaven with him. And that was the only way. If Jesus had gotten off that cross, if he had called down the angels at the at the arrest, if he had done any of that, we would be in a, a lot of trouble. We would not have a way of salvation. And yet Jesus loved us so much that he put aside being the mighty God for a time and said, you know what, I will die on that cross for you and me. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, look today and see you are the mighty God. Your power is unparalleled in the universe. But we're so thankful that for a time and a season you, you coupled that power and came in the form of a little baby that one day grew up and died on the cross for us so that we may have our sins forgiven so that we may be justified by your death for us and that one day we will spend eternity with you, with the mighty God in the new heavens and the new earth. We're thankful for that as we, as we approach this Christmas season. Uh, just help us to remember that you are the mighty God. That when we have troubling times in life, when we have things, challenges, that you are the one who is the ultimate power in the universe that is on our side, that loves us enough to die on the cross for us. And we're just so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand if you wish and join us for a little bit of Alpha. With that.
church sick, obviously. They're dealing with health issues, so just be in prayer for them. And, and uh, what are we going to Let's do the first song we did. What a mighty God we serve. 